cast and a record, record retained on Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Tourism, Communities, Cultural and Leisure Committee. I'm just going to read the webcast notice. This meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the Council website. For those at home viewing the webcast, I'd like to inform you that if you look above the video, you'll see a resources tab. If you select this, a link to the agenda will appear on the right-hand side, and this will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow discussion and debate. Thanks. I don't think I have any apologies for absence. Everybody's here, thank you. Um, I need to ask, do members uh, have any declarations of interest? So I'd like to invite members to declare any interest. Members are asked to consider whether they have any disclosable pecuniary interests and or any other relevant interest in connection with any items on this agenda, and if so, declare them and state the nature of the interest. No declarations? Okay, great, thanks. So you have in your pack the minutes from our last meeting held on the 27th of July. Has everybody managed to read the minutes? Everybody happy they're an ac accurate reflection? Do I need a proposer and seconder or not? No? We're all happy with the minutes, aren't we? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. The next item, item number five, is public and member questions. We haven't received any public questions or statements and petitions, um, and we have not received any questions by members in advance. Do any members have any questions that have just cropped up? No, okay, thanks. So that brings us on to item number six, which is the update on the progress and future development of Wirral Museum Service, which is on pages five to 14. I hope you've all read that report and all of the other reports that were emailed, which uh, there were some really good reports presented to the committee last time, which a few of us were members of, but obviously we've got lots of new members. Um, and in this particular report, I'd like to invite Andy McCartan to open the report, but we have uh, Joe Burns present as well uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. So um, what you've received is an update report on the progress of the uh, William Snark Gallery and the Museum Service. The last report was in March, and that was when the, um, all of our museum sites were still closed. I'm pleased to say that they've now reopened and received some really excellent feedback from, from visitors and from members of the public and from user groups. Um, there are some challenges that um, Joe will talk about when summarising the report going forward, primarily around um, things that have emerged um, as a consequence of the pandemic, in particular um, ventilation within the building. These are being managed at the minute, but um, they will need to be addressed going forward if we're to create the sort of social outcomes and the commercial um, elements that we're looking to, um, you know, introduce to the service to, to make it viable going forward. So I'll pass to um, Joe Burns, Museums Manager, who will summarise the report and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, evening, councillors. Um, so the report updates you on the opening of our two sites. Williamson Art Gallery is now open half past 10 till five o'clock Wednesday to Friday, 
and 10 o'clock till half past four on a Saturday. William uh, Birkenau Priory is open its normal opening hours, so that's afternoons, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and whole day, Saturday and Sunday. Um, we don't have catering at either site currently, but uh, that is being rectified uh, and will be back in place by the 1st of October at the gallery. Um, the catering offer at the Priory has always been a little bit more um, selective, shall we say, because we don't have a ready offer down there. But um, nothing's changed in that respect, whereas the cafe is now coming back on stream at the gallery. Um, we are moving to start the consultation on the strategy, which is what you saw in March. So the consultation with our key stakeholders will be starting in the autumn um, with a view to bringing the final strategy back to committee before the end of the financial year. Um, I don't think there's anything else that needs updating um, against the report unless you have any questions. Thank you, yes, and I appreciate you coming to committee because I know it's ahead of you, your consultation. Uh, we had a few questions that had cropped up and, and we're all aware that you have been through a restructure, so it was just a little bit of reassurance um, around uh, you know, how you're operating going forward, uh, which we were looking for. So that's, the report's fabulous, thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, it gives us a good idea uh, of where we're up to. Uh, can I take members' questions? Councillor Brain, then Councillor Williams. Th thank you, Chair, and thank you, Joe, for, for the report. Um, I spotted yesterday on, on Facebook the, the announcement from the Williamson team saying that our new extended opening hours start from today. The staff are, are doing a tremendous job. Uh, I've been into the gallery a couple of times. It's looking really handsome. The parquet floors are gleaming. There's some wonderful uh, exhibits that have been, that have been brought out of the uh, archives. They're on display. Um, the staff are doing a wonderful job, um, despite the need for masks, they're still we're helpful and welcoming as ever. And obviously we want to encourage as many visitors as we can to enjoy the delights of uh, the Williamson's collection. But I, I would say to describe these opening hours as extended is putting an overly positive gloss on things. Now, I remember during the, the budget setting process we were told that Despite the loss of £90,000 from the budget, the gallery would be open for 34 hours a week. The reality, according to the announcement on Facebook, is it is now just open for 26 hours, and I make that a 24% reduction. And I find this highly alarming, and I suspect the 13,000 people who signed the petition to save the Williamson might well agree with me. The promised evening opening on Thursdays and Fridays isn't taking place. It's closing half an hour earlier on Saturdays. You can't visit on Sundays at all. So we're paying, is it what, 0.4 of a million pounds from a building that we're closing for 142 hours a week. I know there are great difficulties to tackle and, and I'm glad to hear the, the, that a catering offer is going to come back in October. Um, but there is this need for improved ventilation, which we do understand. And at the moment, the gallery can't, be, can't uh, staff the cafe. And I do hope these will only be short-term issues. We fought off an attempt to close this cultural gem a, f a few months ago. And we don't want to go through all that again. But I would suggest we do need to be accurate in our communication and if we are reducing the gallery's availability by 24%, we can't really present that as new extended opening hours. Thank you, uh, Councillor Brain. I, I, without any technical knowledge, I do appreciate that some of our most beautiful, oldest historic buildings are the hardest to make uh, secure. Um, but I'm sure Joe's happy to, uh, to respond to some of your comments. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor, the extended hours that have been announced are because we've added hours every day. So we were open 12 till 5, and we're now open half 10 till 5. We were open 12 till 5 on a Saturday, and so we're opening 10 till 4.30. The reason we're closing slightly earlier is that when the ventilation issues have been addressed, that will enable us to host weddings 
in the evening without disrupting the visitor experience. So we're not opening at half ten till five, we're opening at ten till half four. So it's, it's the same number of hours, it's just slightly earlier so that we can accommodate a potential income generator in the evening without disrupting the visitor experience. So the extension is not where we want to be, but it is an improvement on where we were on the 31st of, of uh, August, or would have been if we'd been open on Tuesdays. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the evening opening is based around... It has, there's two reasons why we haven't extended into the evening. First, we haven't actually had the staff. We are recruiting our final uh, new member of museum um, assistance I starting on the 22nd of September. And at that point, we will have a full quota of museum assistance, which will mean we can open across both sites the number of hours that we wanted to. The second thing is that the evening events are based... The, the evening opening is based around events activity, and at the moment, we, we can't supply that. So... Um, we, we're going softly, softly, making sure that we can deliver what we are saying we're delivering and doing that well before we overextend ourselves. I would hope that within the... Certainly, um, bef by Christmas, I would hope that we can extend the, into the evening. But it's kind of reliant on being able to accommodate enough people to... So, um, I think that's answered all... Yes, uh, th thank you very much. That, that is helpful. Um, you, you, you did say we're hoping to uh, have a cafe offer open from October. I, I wonder, I, I know there have been problems in, you know, finding staff for that, but can you say anything more in detail about what sort of thing will be offered from, from next month? Um, my understanding is that there will be a, an extended menu, maybe not the full aspiration but certainly a lunch offer um, as well as coffee and cake um, the, the new till system will be in so that they can take card payments um, so I've had confirmation that they will have an offer ready for the 1st of October um, and that it will be um, a more extensive menu than has been previously offered but we haven't firmed up exactly what's on that menu but certainly uh, previously we'd looked at having kids lunches things like sausage rolls which is enough to make you stop being a vegetarian um so we're looking at, at danish pastries and so on but that hasn't been confirmed i literally got confirmation today that they are confident that they can have a, a catering offer from the first of october um whether or not quite how extensive the menu is i think is still to be confirmed as soon as it's confirmed, we will be trailing it. As soon as we can, we know that we can do it, we will be trailing it uh, uh, across social media. Thank you. Councillor Jay Williams. And uh, um, in, as far as um, uh, the, the overall strategy mentions, the uh, consult consultation for the Birkenhead Culture and Heritage Strategy to support the town investment plan for Birkenhead attracted a significant level of comments uh, for Wirral Museums, despite the Wir Wirral being outside, Williamson being outside the curtilage of the strategy. Well, you know, the Williamson is, is in the center of the, the, these strategies, um, and really that is, a, you know, an incorrect statement. It's an in integral part, and it is of great importance. And uh, it's not only the Williamson that we're talking about, it's likes of the Priory, you know, and, and the tourism importance um, of the Priory that we need to look at. And o overall, um, in relation to the heritage strategies, um, I mean, we've got a, a very vibrant uh, set of um, heritage strategies, uh, particularly in the Birkenhead area. And, and, of course, about one issue we've got at the moment, which the officers, as maybe the officers can ask, because ask, I've asked this at the highest level, is the fact that we don't know, we don't know the future of Birkenhead Town Hall yet. 
uh, and Birkenhead Town Hall is absolutely key to delivering all the massive, uh, you know, tourism um, uh, projects that we've got. It's absolutely there in the middle. And, you know, Birkenhead Town Hall is in limbo at the moment. So there's many other uh, questions that I'll ask, and I'll have, I'll have you here all day, which I won't. But, um, you know, th those are, but the Williamson, you know, we mustn't, we must do, as I agree with Alan, we've got to do everything to get the uh, Williamson, you know, uh, working in the most appropriate way. And if you ever want to see how, you know, heritage and tourism works from a local standpoint, go to the new ferry show, which I had the pleasure to go to over the weekend, where they brought in uh, history reenactors. Uh, you had a, they had a Spitfire, a Messerschmitt, they had a lady singing the Boogie Woogie Beautiful Boy Company B in, uh, in all the 1940s song. But you know, the, the educational value of that alone is just fine. It's the horrible histories uh, and you know the reenactors that tell history to people. I mean, my own grandchildren came back from the Yorvik Center in, um, in York and said, you know, they were, they were all, you know, people dressed up in period costumes. It was fantastic. We learned so much. So just, uh, but there we are, you know, at the same time, we're cutting our events team to pieces. We don't have an events team anywhere. How, I mean, how can we move all these tourism projects forward when we're cut, cutting everything to the bone at basic levels? And th this is the, the big danger that we've got here. We've got big projects going ahead but we've got to make sure we've got the people to run them. And by decimating the, um, you know, the team from the, um, the events team, again, just, just doesn't help. And as I say, in relation to, to tourism and heritage, uh, there's a great example for you as far as um, how we you know, project our area um, and interest, you know, and uh, the new Ferry, Fest Ferry Festival did it in a fantastic way. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jerry. Just before I bring in officers to respond, because there was quite a lot in there. So in October, on our work programme, we have the Birkenhead Culture and Heritage Strategy, part of Birkenhead 2040 Regeneration Framework, which we were hoping to bring to this committee in September. Unfortunately, it had to be delayed um, till October. Um, so lots of your points are very valid for definitely for the next committee. And also in advance of the next committee, I would suggest the Econ and Regen contacts that aren't here at the moment, um, you know, could help you in advance of, of the next Already committee. Already doing meeting. it. Great, thank you. Um, the other things you mentioned, um, I thought you were going to mention the Wirral Heritage Open Days, because obviously that's a perfect time from Friday the 10th of September through to the uh, 19th on the Sunday. There's lists online of all of the buildings that are open, all of the walking tours and all the visits that can be arranged. So to display Wirral Heritage is coming up very soon and that's a great uh, time to showcase it. Um, just to bring it back uh, to the Williamson, um, obviously you're taking part uh, in that. And um, we asked for this report to come just to see had we managed with the restructure we had to make some very difficult decisions and in those budget meetings in the March committee, you know, and leading up to that, unfortunately, you were part of the committee that had to agree to cut the culture team. We had some very difficult choices to make. So we can't say that that's external to this process. In this committee, we made that decision, unfortunately. People are now managing as best they can with the resources they have. So are you happy to come back on a couple of the points, Joe? Yeah, but just, sorry, just one point. Heritage Open Day, sorry, I'll take my mask off. Heritage Open Days, I, I was one of the instigators of Heritage Open Days in, the, in this area. We had the second highest uh, Heritage Open Days in the country literally uh, three or four years ago. Lincoln was the only city ahead of us, and it's one of our you know, areas, uh, uh, massively positive areas. As far as um, you know, the officers making decisions, of course it's difficult, but we can't, we can't run down one area and promote the other. We've got to get a fine balance, and that's my point there. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there anything you'd like to come back on, Nikki? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Um, I think the points, obviously, are very valid. Um, we're bringing this report 
by way of an update and some assurances of the work that's planned. Um, also, we're coming out of a pandemic and a lot of those resources um, have been focused on supporting our response um, to that pandemic. So I think this is about us rebalancing. It's about us looking forward now. It's about us recalibrating the staff that we have got and looking at the responses by the local public to how much um, the Williamson and, and local culture means to them. And that, that came through strongly in the budget cons consultation. And we're responding and, and reacting to that with what's to come um, going forward through, through the autumn and into the spring. And obviously we look forward to working with you as the heritage champion as, and the whole committee here. So really appreciate the support of this committee. Um, Thanks, Nikki. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Williams. I think the, the reference to the Williamson being outside of the curtilage is probably more typographical in that there's a, there's a red line, I suspect, drawn around the um, town investment plan, and the Williamson just falls outside the red line. But I think what's more reassuring for me is the fact that um, people have taken the time to respond, even though it's outside, and respond about the Williamson and, and the, you know, the value they place on the, on the museum service. But I can assure you that as part of that whole, you know, and I won't speak on behalf of Joe, but Joe has been sort of regularly um, reviewing the strategies relating to Birkenhead and in, in regular dialogue with um, those people who are leading on it, including quite extensive feedback on, on that strategy. So we are very much linked into that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to come back, Joe? I don't think I've got anything to add, really. I think that's covered it, yeah. That, that it's a technical statement. You know, the Williamson is outside the boundary for the consultation. Um, but as Andy said, uh, despite that, people have included us. We're working really closely with colleagues um, in, e in regen, in economic development, as well as adults and children and everything. So we, we are embedded across the piece and we'll be supporting the tourism effort as well as our most vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you. Did I see Steve indicate? Yeah. And then Jenny. And then Pat. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, in the report, 3.2.3 talks about the Woodall Transport Museum. Um, and there's a paragraph about the 2030 vision. Um, can that be expanded at all yet? Or is it still too early to um, hear any details about that? If you just bear with me, councillor, while I open it so I can read the paragraph, my computer keeps going to sleep. Um, I think th this, the Transport Museum is um, a bit of a strange beast in as much as it's operated by volunteers and owned by us. And, and clearly, because we've got a heritage tram operating on the highway, um, it can't be given over solely to the volunteers. So for, and this is in draft. So, and clearly the, the Midside Tramway Preservation Society will be key stakeholders in this consultation. For, for us in the museum service, that's our aspiration for the Transport Museum. Whether or not it's their aspiration, I don't know yet. Um, I was there today looking at how we can get it reopened. Um, and we're starting to talk to the volunteers about what that might mean. But at the end of the day, they're volunteers and you know, they, they will make the decisions about how much they're willing to do in terms of compliance with COVID guidance and so on. Um, so that, yeah, it's, it's our aspiration. Um, I want them to be an accredited museum. I want them to be functioning at the highest level and offering the, the best service um, to visitors and and schools and everything, but but how much they want that, how much they want to develop, that's that's not my call, and I haven't had that conversation to be fair. And if it hadn't been for COVID, we would have been a lot further down the line with those conversations. So, thank you, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joe. Um, if we're looking at 3.6.4, that's your income generation plans for the museum services. 
Um, fantastic group of ideas there for Grow Back and also in development. I just wanted a bit more information, please, on your timings for those and also priorities. So where you think the income will come from and the priorities and timings, obviously knowing you're, you're struck by COVID um, priorities at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, timings. I have no idea because almost all of those are reliant on being able to get a level of people through a door and in a room for a length of time. And currently, I can't do that. We, tonight, as I speak, uh, one of our regular hirers has come back. Um, we're limiting numbers. They are, they're in the cafe, which is not an ideal place to do a presentation on small arms in the Western Front. Um, so we're trying, but whilst we're on such limited capacities, it's, I can't put a time frame on it. And, and I know that's not what you want to hear, it's not what I want to say. But until we can operate at something approaching normal levels, that income generation is going to be almost impossible to achieve because it's reliant on events, it's reliant on activity, and that's not something we can deliver consistently at the moment. Um, I'm hoping when the cafe comes back and gets operational, then we'll see income there. I mean, we didn't normally, we didn't previously get income from our cafe, it was a service. I'm hoping that the working with the floral, we will deliver a service that actually generates some profit for the gallery as well. Um, we're already talking about our wedding offer, which is one of the reasons we've adjusted the, the opening times, so that we can get a wedding in at half five. You can get married at half past six on a Saturday, everybody, if you want. Um, and you can get married at the gallery, so you can have your ceremony, your reception, your photographs. But we need to be able to have more than 14 people in a space for most weddings. There are niche weddings that would do. But, so, in terms of time, I can't tell you. In terms of priorities, I think prioritising is growing back what we had before because we know there's a market there, we know there's interest, and it's just about winning back those people that might have gone somewhere else. U3A meet with us, used to meet with us every other Monday. They've gone somewhere else, but they want to come back. They're just waiting for us to be able to welcome them back. So priorities will be the grow back and the in development because we'd already started talking about them. We'd already started, we're already starting to do the work to get us on as a traded service for schools. That works in development as we speak. Um, we've already started looking at um, seminars for local creatives. How do you get your product to market? You know, what, do you, what packaging, what do you need to look at for your packaging? Where's your price points? Is it normal to pay 40% commission? So we're looking at that. We're looking at meet the funder sessions. But again, a lot of this is down to actually being able to get people in the building. Um, now we're back in. We're nearly fully staffed. We might be able to take some of that online. That's a possibility that we will be starting to explore now we've got the staffing in. But an online offer is harder to charge for in many ways. Um, we have got a Jessup going um, to see if we can get some money for an online till system so that we can take online donations because at the moment to make a donation you have to be in the space we're looking at contactless donations because people don't carry money anymore so we're, we're looking at, at doing what we can with what we've got but we're not going to see any significant step change until we can have a significant step change in visitor numbers does that answer your question? It does, but I'm still asking about timings. When you think that might be? Because there are so many, obviously, other locations now which are open and are offering the services. Just idea about timing would be helpful. Thank you. I can't answer that question. Asset management have to answer that question. That's Andy a, can answer okay. that question. He just yeah. waved at me. That's OK, thanks. Yeah, obviously, when you have uh, separate galleries with 12 and 14 people only, um, it, it's always it's always constricted, but um, we've got probably hope, hopefully an update on the aircon. <laughs> yeah, 
it, it is an update, um, just, to, just to say that there will be quite extensive conversations taking place in the next couple of weeks over the, the ventilation. Members will be aware that um, at one point, just after the building reopened, um, there, was, there was quite a, um, I'll call it damning report on the ventilation, and in the meantime we did manage to get interim measures to get open, but I think, Councillor Johnson, the, the point of a lot of those activities is that success will breed success, and we've already got some some really high profile inquiries for um, next year that we do not want to miss out on, um, particularly given all the work that's gone in, as as Councillor Brain alluded to earlier, in terms of the quality of the building. I think you know, if nothing else, the the downtime has given us a chance to make the building incredibly attractive, and I do believe that in terms of all those those um, offers and ideas listed there that. They are all deliverable and they will all make the, the building a really vibrant space that people will come back to, not only those people who've gone, um, but, you know, word of mouth, social media, all those things are quite powerful in, in, and these organisations do talk to each other. So I think it, if we can get this right, if we can get these issues resolved, then it, it could be a really, really attractive venue. And, you know, if it, if it helps, we're happy to, you know, keep the, the, the committee updated probably outside of these meetings, but on, on progress of that as well. Thanks, Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to bring the discussion back to the uh, the regeneration issue that was discussed early, and it's it's reassuring to hear that, you know, staff are speaking to the team in, in regeneration, but I wanted to focus particularly on the, the town deal fund for Birkenhead. Um, so that was a £45 million bid uh, through the Town Deal programme, of which we, we've been awarded £25 million. Pounds. And if you read the Town Deal prospectus, you'll see that it's based around eight catalyst projects. And the relevant one from our point of view is the East-West Cultural Access for Birkenhead, um, which doesn't actually mention the Priory. What it, what it does say in summary is that the Birkenhead framework will create experiences that entice and encourage people to follow the path linking central Birkenhead with the waterfront. This needs to be an active corridor and network across Birkenhead with a focus on culture and creativity. And I suppose to, to go back to some of the points that were raised earlier, you know, we all know about the cost pressures and I think the success uh, for our cultural and museums offer going forward is to a large extent going to depend on how well we integrated with the regeneration programme. So my specific kind of point is around the town deal fund because as I say, we got 25 million out of the 45 million. We have a, a pitch that was based around eight catalytic projects, one of which is very, very relevant to what this committee wants to see achieved in terms of the uh, success of the museum offer, particularly uh, the Priory. Now, the next meeting of the Town Deal Board is Friday of next week. So obviously there are going to be some very important decisions made very, very soon about where we slice and dice that 25 million pounds out of the 45 million pounds that we bid for. So my question really is, what are we doing specifically, I suppose, to lobby internally uh, with colleagues in regeneration to make sure that we're pitching uh, appropriately for uh, the museums and cultural offer within that Birkenhead regeneration framework, thinking particularly of the fact that you know the Woodside area is really coming back to life. There's a lot more happening down at Woodside there is an inadequate um, kind of pedestrian experience, shall we put it, from the Woodside and the town centre to the Priory. And, and, you know, changing that is going to be really, really important for the future success of the Priory. So I suppose I'm looking for some kind of reassurance around the fact that we're aware that really important decisions are going to be made around very serious sums of money soon, and that we are... Uh, I suppose having the appropriate conversations within the council with colleagues from regeneration around that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, thanks, and it'll come up again in our next committee. Andy, do you want to respond? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. The answer is yes, we are aware, and those conversations are being had with um, regen colleagues. I'm aware that there's funding. Um, bids put in for upgrades to the Priory and um, refurbishment of the Chapter House, um, in addition to uh, quite significant sums for 
um, pedestrian uh, pedestrian walkways and cycling around the area, including Hamilton Square. So we are aware of it. And um, again, I know Joe has had some of those conversations, but we are talking to um, Kathy Wignall, who's the lead um, regeneration officer on those on those projects. Thanks for that answer. And then obviously at, at, at the October committee, yes, it's pivotal that um, we have some responses, but if the uh, decisions are being made so soon, then yes, we need to also lobby individually. Um, uh, did you want to come back on that, Jo? I was just going to say, we, we bang the drum um, endlessly for this. We talk to people, we, we lobby, and we talk to... Um, so we're talking to the active uh, transport strategy people. We're talking to the town deal people. Um, we might not do it formally, but we're making those links and, and lobbying for our inclusion. Um, and certainly the green transport, the blue and green strategy, um, and the BRF is all looking at active transport um, and seeing certainly the Priory as an anchor destination of that waterfront experience. So... Um, uh, yeah, just rest assured, we're, we're working really hard to make sure we're part of that conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I just want, just before I bring uh, Councillor Gilchrist in, I just wanted to ask a thought about it, um, to bring it back to the Williamson specifically. Um, so a lot of your user groups um, were also reliant on some funding streams depending on their activity. Uh, the Wirral Arts Society able to go ahead with the open or are some of the other user groups able to go ahead with things because sometimes it has a knock-on effect to their own uh, funding streams. In terms of the Wirral Arts, um, Arts Society, um, that's part of the programming for the exhibitions for next year and we are planning to restart our temporary exhibition programme before, before Christmas. Um, we're also planning, we've got Wirral Open Studios tour uh, next week. Very different experience to what, what we normally have, but we're, we're managing it and we're, we've got Oxton Art Fair coming in as well. Again, a very different experience, but we will, we will have um, them in on the 7th of November. If that's a Sunday, don't quote me, because I... Oh, I, haven't, I haven't got a calendar in my head. But yeah, so we're starting to work with those user groups and it's, it might be a different offer, it might be a slightly different approach, but yeah. And by next year, this time next year, we will be back to normal, whatever normal is in terms of COVID. But we will be having the fullest offer we can have. Um, and that will include Will Arts Society. It will include the open which we haven't had for two years now. It will include all of those key events that, that people hold dear, as well as working with new, um, new artists to, to bring in new exhibitions, including, I believe, a Ladybird book exhibition. So that's really exciting. I think we signed the contract yesterday. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're working really hard with those groups and we're testing the water like we have done with Western Front today to see what we can achieve within the existing restrictions to support those people to come back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, yeah. We all need to um, pray for some good weather then because you can make the most of the outdoor space as well. Councillor Gilchrist and then Councillor Spriggs. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I've been pondering on this issue of regeneration and the town deal. It struck me there must be some promotional budgets in the town deal funding and it crossed my mind that somehow Williamson has to piggyback on those because there must be ideas of meanwhile uses, I think they're called, in shop fronts and other places that currently are, are unoccupied that could be um, grabbed or used to promote various facilities, uh, some artwork, um, modern techniques. They can do things fairly readily, I think, but to fill some shop windows with materials about the Williamson and all these other facilities as part of a promotional process. If the promotion budget staffing is under such pressure, there might be ways of wangling it out of the town deal. So I'll leave that thought. The second thing I wanted was I'm delighted that Jerry, I think, mentioned horrible histories. Um, I know I spent three days wandering around churchyards in Herefordshire as my holiday this year, um, and those sort of things interest and inspire me from Norman arches to um, memorials. But 
obviously museums have moved on from the days when people went shh and children weren't allowed to do things or interact. So I'm delighted that we're in a new era of involving young people. The one thing that leapt out to me, just a little concern in the report, is in 3.2.4, which says it's on page 10 of 42, but it's printed page number 8. And in 3.2.4, it talks about den building at the Priory. And I've just, just crossed my mind that what with health and safety and uncertain levels and gravestones and paving and things, quite what is included in den building at the Priory. I'm not poo-pooing the idea, because obviously if you want young people to go and not just, um, just look around at things and think, that's it, there must be something for young people there, young children coming with families. But what do we mean by the den building, please, Jeff? Yeah. Den building is run by our colleagues from the play team in children... Um, I don't know which bit of the council they're in anymore, but I, colleagues from play... And they bring everything with them. It includes cargo nets and tent poles and, and, and they build dens on the grass. We, we don't want them to go and camp out in um, crypts or climb trees or anything. So it's a supervised activity. Um, it would work really well in this kind of context because you come in a family group, you make a den, possibly leave your child in den for a little while. Um, so yeah, it's, it's supervised, everything's provided and it's risk assessed to death like everything is nowadays so uh, never fear councillor we're not going to be um, burying any small people thank you thanks chair councillor spriggs yes thanks chair thanks hello joe great to see you um so uh, thank you very much for the report and i think it's been a really interesting conversation because it's been very wide-ranging across delivery elements of delivery to specifics around things like safety of children's play in dens, to bigger strategic questions. And so um, some of my questions are around that, a bit more around that strategic side of things, I think, um, which maybe, you know, uh, Nikki and, and Andy could, could also be um, chipping in on. Um, it's great that people have, uh, that uh, members of uh, colleagues have picked up on 1.3. I did raise this myself at the, um, at the um, meeting setting. Um, uh, and I think for me, the point about making sure that the Williamson is in included is, yes, we know that it's outside the geographical boundary of the, the auspices of, the, of the, 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 the strategy. But I think um, what I'm heart heartened to hear is that there is an understanding of how important it is. There's a synergy. You can't have a, a, a cultural town deal that's really going to work and you, you know, you're not bringing in people like yourself and you know, the resources, the cultural assets that we've got. It has to be all, all brought together. So I think we've, we're getting some reassurance there. That's really good. Um, I, oh, it's gone off. Um, so, yeah, I'm also really pleased that um, you, you addressed the issue, Joe, of, of including uh, the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the, in the key stakeholders that we're going to negotiate with, because believe you me, Arts Council and Heritage Lottery are watching what we're all doing. They, when I was Cabinet Member, they were coming and having regular visits when for years they hadn't had much to do with the Wirral and there was there was a real disconnect and that's been really getting improved so I'm glad to see that that's that that's uh, you know being being looked at as well I, I do think though um, for me one of the issues that has come across an, uh, from a number of the responses and um, both questions from members and also responses is is this no notion of capacity for our teams to be able to deliver on ambitious plans um, I am concerned that you know we 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 are knocking, you're knocking hard on the door um, around the town deal fund. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we must make sure that we as a, as a committee can make sure that we are um, talking very confidently to our regen colleagues to say, you can't just talk about wanting to use the arts and culture for place shaping. Um, and it sounds good and it looks good on a report. You have to resource it. And that's including resourcing people. Um, so it's so our region, our, our cultural regeneration is not just about east-west axes, accesses, because that's infrastructure. It's about the people who are going to make this happen. You know, 3.1.2 talks about 
working with local artists. And I'm not going to ask you now because we've, you've been bombarded with questions, but it really would be good to, to bring something forward at the next committee when we're going to go into it in more detail, Chair. What is this work with local artists? Because they're, the, they're the heartbeat of this. We've done loads of work to make the Arts Council understand that we know that there is tremendous artistic talent and creative talent in our borough. Um, so it'd be great to know what's coming forward with that. And then maybe some of the solutions to how stretched some of our staff are could be found in some of those things. I mean, you talked earlier, Joe, about um, you know, doing toolkits for, for local artists to um, you know, give them you know, some help and support and you know, what they should be charging and stuff like that. That shouldn't really be your job. Um, so we have to be looking at that and looking at the different strands. Um, I also was going to ask about income generation and tell us more, but you, you did give us more detail. It's just, you know, it'd be great to know more about when that's coming through. Um, so um, some of the questions I was going to ask have been, have been touched upon, but I think the big strategic questions, we really do need to, to be uh, looking at them and grappling with, grappling with them when we, we meet in October, Chair, and when we have colleagues from Regen, because I have asked about this before, you know, how do we all connect up? Because what we don't want to do is miss the boat, as Councillor Cleary is, is, is clearly um, indicating. Because this is an opportunity of a lifetime, and we've got to get it right now, because they're not going to come along every five minutes. So I'm sorry again to make uh, statements, but I've, you know, a number of the questions were answered, and I am concerned about that bigger strategic head forward and where the vision is coming from. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And in an ideal world, we would have had it for this committee. Um, I think we accept um, that uh, directors were really trying to make it September and it's just pushed back to October um, and I'm pleased that Joe managed to make it September otherwise he would have had a, a gap um, and I've been in the gallery and seen some local artists so we do have some um, exhibition space for them and I've seen this art, art in churches trailers is that at the moment um, so Thankfully, local artists, you know, do thrive. But yes, we need to do everything to facilitate that as well. Sorry, Chair, I, I'm not just talking about visual artists. I'm yeah. talking about photographers, dancers, theatre yeah. makers, you jo know, filmmakers. Joe's going to come back in. Yeah, yeah and I'm just, you know, just coming back to you because I'm just wanting to, to clarify what I mean by you know, supporting local artists. Cheers. Joe, would you want to respond about um, all arts, even though, you know, the, the space is used by all artists? Um, just to unpack that slightly, um, maybe we shouldn't be doing the job, but we have a, a shop and we have people coming in who want to sell through our shop and sometimes they need some help to get to that point. Um, I would like to work with the Chamber. I know we're going out for business support. Uh, the contract for business support is going out soon. And I am lobbying hard that we look at creative industries development within that and, and digital within that because they're growth sectors. And if we've got that support in the chamber, then maybe we don't have to be doing it at the gallery. Um, we are looking at, um, when we get the evening opening, one of the things we'll be looking at doing is actually programming local bands and local... Um, probably not banging techno, to be fair. Probably thinking acoustic duos some spoken words. So we're looking at actually developing that wider offer. Um, one of my aspirations for the Priory is actually um, a programme of contemporary art down there. So we're looking at all sorts of things and we're looking at joining up with colleagues to deliver in different spaces. Um, but yeah, you're right. We need that wider vision. Um, we're in the mix with our colleagues from Regen. Um, I bang on to anybody who'll listen. <laughs> about the role of culture in regeneration and, and place building and all that. Um, we need to look at art in, in the public realm and public art. Um, there needs to be a strategy for 106 monies. Um, and all of this is, all these discussions are going on. Um, I think part of the problem is the discussions go on between officers and they need to be in some kind of shape before we can bring them to members because you don't just want to hear us whittling on about what needs to happen. You want to know how we're going to deliver it. But some of those conversations about the how and the why need to happen first. So um, I do know that the colleagues in, in Regeneration are very, very um, switched on to the role of culture. And you're not going to have an economic regeneration if you don't have a cultural one as well. 
you're not going to have an economically successful borough if you don't have a culturally successful borough as well. You're not going to bring the, the most deprived constituents in Wirral into the vision for the future without good quality participatory arts, without good quality cultural offer that makes sense to them. And I think we've got the building blocks for that within and without the council. And I think those conversations are starting to be had. And I think we're pushing against an open door. We just need to make sure we kick it wide open and take everybody with us. And I think we are, we are at the start of that process. And I think it feels different, Chris, now. You know, talking to people in Regen, they listen, they get it. And that feels different, you know. And you've got the likes of Craig Pennington doing amazing things down with Future Yard. You've got Chris Lee building Start Yard. You know, the, 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 the people at Bloom are producing some of the most... The, 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 the producing the largest number of artists in the shorter space of time. We need to build progression routes for them. Yeah, you know, it's all there. It's all there. Can I just come back quickly? Sorry, I'm Thank you. Flynn. Yeah, yes, uh, Joe. I, it was me that brought some of those people into the council when I was cabinet member, and it was it was myself that's been, you know, had loads of done loads of work to get those conversations going with the region. So it's great to hear that, hear back from you that I know that those things are happening. I just think we're at that place where we just need to make sure it does carry through absolutely clearly. Low, it, it is good, and it hasn't happened overnight. There's been years of this kind of work being done to sort of get our regen team into a place where they do get it but then it's got to be resourced and the team's got to be resourced and the vision's got to be there and I wasn't just talking about um, local artists in in terms of the museums I was talking about our whole borough offer because that's the lifeblood and you've mentioned some of those people Craig Pennington um, uh, you know the people at Bloom and Convenience Gallery all of those people and they all love the Williamson and want to be promoting the Williamson so we've really got an opportunity here and that's what I'm 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 wanting to get across to this committee tonight the opportunity we've got to get it right and you're absolutely right so thanks for that thank you okay I think oh thank okay Jill we're counselor Thanks, Chair. I left it till the end because it's actually um, point 10 on the environment and climate implications. Um, on 10.1, it talks about modernising our venues and that would reduce environmental impacts. 10.2 is saying, where possible, we will invest in environmentally friendly solutions and designs. And then at 10.3, it says, as a result of the initiatives outlined above. So I, I'm basically trying to just understand, is there a package in place in order to modernise, in order to come up with those solutions um, because th 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 there's not much sort of depth to what is stated there and I know it's at the end of the report and there is a requirement to report on environment and climate implications but I'm just wondering how much support you are getting in that and also what plans there are or I, I don't know whether there are because it's, it, it mentions something but it doesn't actually say whether something is happening within the short term, medium term or long term in terms of the buildings. Thank you. Is, uh, Andy can uh, help with this. Or oh, Nikki, sorry. Thanks, Councillor Wood. Um, so we are working um, as officers with our climate emergency team. Um, so whilst that's quite a broad statement and you've heard tonight around some of the issues with our build, you know, the building itself and, and some of those uh, ventilation issues, we will do whatever we can in terms of our... We have agreed you know we've got the climate emergency we've got a policy in place now so where, whether it's through our procurement routes um where we can be you know have our um climate agenda in, ensure that's robustly um engage with with any of our procurement so that those elements are picked up i think the building we need to to work with um further with our environment team around what what's possible um, but the, the intent is there. Um, we, we, we know what we need to do in terms of the, the climate ag agenda and the action plan, and we've got a team, a resource team, that can support Joe, Andy, and myself to deliver that. Um, so, again, I think it's, that's a, a work in progress, but um, Joe might have examples yeah, of, of initiatives that we're looking to do, but it's certainly something um, that we are... You know, focused on for the future because we, we have to deliver on that as part of our wider climate agenda. 
If I may, and I forgot to remiss me as well to say thank you for the report, Chair, as well. Um, I should have said that at the start. It, it was to see whether, I say, uh, to make sure that you um, have that support in order to, to, to carry out what needs to be done. Um, and uh, as you've just said, then, Nikki, you're saying it, it is happening. But it would be, because it's at the end of a report and it's at the end of lots of reports, it does feel like it's just an add-on message at times. That's how it comes across in the reporting. Um, and it, it, nothing is kind of backed up. And even if we look at saying about, you know, reducing um, emissions by car usage, is that how are we monitoring that? What are What is the monitoring that is going on? So I'd like to be able to see that there's an unpacking of the environment and climate implications in order to report it better. Thanks. Did you want to come back with any examples? Yeah, just briefly, um, two things. One, the, the monitoring of how people get to our gallery is really difficult. Get back to capacity, you know. Actually, that kind of level of data collection is, is um, challenging. That said, um, as a museum and gallery space, our biggest carbon impact is people travelling to see us. We like football stadiums. It's, it's, the, it's the commute or the, the travel. So one of the key things that isn't in here because it was kind of in development before this was, it didn't mash up, um, is looking at our digital offer and looking at um, trying to um, make our collections publicly searchable online. So you quite often get people who will travel to come and see a pot. If they can see a pot online, then that might reduce that travel. So we're looking at, at trying to improve collections accessibility digitally. Alongside that, we're enhancing our digital offer, um, not just for people, not just to take into care settings for people who physically can't get there, but to maybe reduce the number of visits. And we'll be working with, certainly down at the Priory and, and again at the gallery as it rolls out there, working with our active transport strategy to see how we can support that. Um, one of the key things would help us is Mersey Travel getting more buses to us, but I suspect that's outside my area of influence. But um, if we can encourage people to cycle, if we can encourage people to cycle up from the park, we'll be looking at all of those, but they're, they're the longer term. But for us, our biggest impact is those car journeys, so if we can reduce them. That said, a large proportion of our visitors are from CH43, so they're within walking distance. So it's about encouraging those, that walking activity, um, which we can start doing once we can guarantee that you can get a cup of coffee and cool off and, and have a piece of cake as a treat and so on. So um, it's something we're aware of. We are looking at it in terms of what we can do from within the building rather than as a more corporate response. And the same down at the Priory, active transport. We're on the circular trail for the, almost on the circular trail for the, the cycle route. We're looking at how we join up with the end of Dock Branch Park, which is all about active travel options. So it, it's there, it's in our thinking. We might not have articulated it in a strategy, but it is there. Thank you Thanks, so much Jim. for that. Yeah, and uh, you, you highlighted something with regard to transport as well, is that it's, and you, you've been singing the praises and the positive engagement you had with Econ and Regen and it feels like for this agenda um, although it's always at the bottom of a report is that it kind of needs to sort of come further up and it needs to be those strengthening of um, conversations with transport and with the environment teams but you know as you say it is work in progress and I say it would just be nice to sort of see some greater depth to what those statements mean because it, they just seem a bit woolly the way they are because where possible just doesn't seem to answer anything at all but I appreciate it's um, challenging as well thank you yeah thanks councillor Wood. it's I mean you've hit the the nub of all of it a listed building not close to a train station um which has yeah it, it, it's it's at the heart of all of it and um, I think uh, Andy McCartan's going to uh, contribute thank you chair yeah councillor Wood, just to add um we are across a number of sites currently working on a number of um decarbonisation pilots now as you'd expect They've been primarily targeted at the most um, energy sapping buildings, I suppose is the best way of putting it, such as swimming pools and things like that. But I suspect a lot of the learning from that will be carried over into some of these older buildings like the Williamson. So, but I agree, yeah, things like that need to go in um, 
in the future into this report. So, thank you. Andy, if I may ask a question. I mean, do, I don't know sort of from rural council's perspective how much whether there was um, bids went in for these um, public sector building decarbonisation funds. So, and I'm assuming that's there, and that's where I'd like to see that marry up. Is that if that has happened, then and it is relevant to a particular building within a particular remit, then it would be good to be able to see that reporting and that positivity there. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kenny. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, to thank Joe really for the um, for the very positive presentation and the way you've you've handled the issues tonight, which is refreshing. I mean, sometimes I feel, Chair, that the main role of this committee seems to be, well, what can we cut this time? What savings can we make? What 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 reductions in services can we give to residents, which can be very very disheartening. So, I mean, so, I mean, sometimes, obviously, we have to make difficult decisions, but it's, it's heartening tonight to have a discussion where we're talking positively about getting more people involved, getting young people involved, etc. And I'd like to think that that would be the main, you know, thrust of the way we go forward as a committee. As far as the, um, you mentioned about buses, well, I, I know over the last year or so, uh, a number of councillors, uh, some in this room uh, are involved in active discussions with Mersey Travel about improving the whole question of bus services, which will hopefully make it a lot easier for people to be able to get to places like the Williamson, because at the moment it can be difficult, and we, we want to discourage people using the car, even if they've got one, for, for those people, for example, who live on places like the Beechwood, where I represent, to get to someone like the Williamson without a car can be very, very difficult. So we are in active discussions now. And we've got meetings lined up over the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that will help to improve the overall situation. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks. I'll echo those sentiments about it being positive, especially that you're feeling that um, all of the separate silos are all joining up much better and the vision is shared. That's really encouraging. And I think the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Scrutiny Committee is looking at the bus uh, strategy in the next couple of days, and so we'll expect to see an awful lot more from that going forwards. Um, is it going to be quick, Councillor Spriggs? It really is, um, Councillor Cameron. Um, yeah, so there's, a re there's really direct ways that we can start to make some exciting things happen here, because Future Yard, which is the live music venue that obviously uh, had their festival last weekend, I attended, it was absolutely amazing. Um, their, their ambition is to become the first carbon neutral music venue in the country. So they must be doing things and thinking about things in a really interesting way. So they're the kinds of conversations which I think we can, you know, engender and support so that, you know, what Craig's doing can come and come and talk to you, Joe, come and talk to Nikki, come and talk to Andrew and start to say, well, this is how we're actually doing it in the commercial sector and share practice because I know that they'd be really up for that. Cheers, Chair. Yeah, thanks. You've mentioned the future charge a couple of times, which um, sounds really exciting. Um, I think they received £60,000 from the DCMS, didn't they? Um, f which, which they, th yeah, which is which is really good because um, obviously, because um, obviously that all matters. But yeah, uh, hopefully the creative sector are really good at all joining up anyway. But if we can facilitate that, it would be ideal. If there's no more questions, I'm happy to move the recommendation. So you have a recommendation. Um, and it is that the, the Tourism, Communities, Culture and Leisure Committee notes the contents of this report and supports the ongoing work to increase high quality cultural engagement with rural museum service for residents and visitors. I'm happy to propose that. Do I have a second? Seconded. Councilor Spriggs. Thank you. Are we happy to agree by assent? Agreed. Uh, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks for uh, not only coming uh, against the schedule that we originally had, uh, but being able to respond so, so well to all of our questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, councillors. Good evening. Which brings us on to um, item number seven, which is the quarter one financial monitoring report. On pages 15 to 30, um, I hope you've all read all of the detail and, um, and we have um, Sarah Cox has kindly joined us. I'd like to invite Sarah to open the report. Um, this report is a finance report for quarter one financial information. The recommendations of the report are as follows. Note the year-end forecast revenue position, which is 328,000 adverse variants as of quarter one. Note the progress on achievement of approved savings for 21-22. Note the reserves which have been allocated to this committee. 
and note the year-end forecast capital position, which is just over 4.9 million favourable as at quarter one. Um, just briefly going through revenue monitoring, the revenue forecast position is for, projected to be 328,000 adverse. This consists mainly of community safety of 190,000, which is due to income shortfalls, and 137,000 within culture and visitor economy, which is due to income loss as events were unable to take place and due to timing delay for what, in implementing one of the savings um, because an empl employees were like working the notice periods for part of the time. Um, there are income shortfalls in other areas, but adverse variants have not been reported as it is expected the overall shortfall will be mitigated from COVID-19 funding throughout the year. Um, just moving on to savings progress. Most savings for this committee are on track to be fully achieved. There's only one saving relating to tourism and visitor economy that's reporting a 40k shortfall this year. And that's due to, as mentioned before, due to employee notice periods, because there's been part year costs this year. And the full year, cost, full year effect of that saving will not be seen until 22, 23. But all of the savings are currently flagged as green and they're on track to be achieved. And just moving on to the reserve section, um, at the moment, there's £50,000 worth of reserves projected to be used as at quarter one. Um, that may increase throughout the year and it will be reviewed later in the year for any more increases in reserves or use of reserve later on in future quarters. Um, capital Table 5 just shows a summarised version of capital schemes because there's a number of schemes in this area and there's quite a large amount to include in the report. So a breakdown of every capital scheme is um, shown in Appendix A. At the moment, there's a favourable variance reported of 4.9 million, and this is due to delays in commencing some of the works. There's a lot of the works are relating to either leisure or library, and they've, they've been um, suspended due to reviews, and schemes have been slipped into 22-23 instead. Um, capital and revenue monitoring, this will be reviewed throughout the year, and any changes will be reported as, the, as we become aware of them in future quarters. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to either take them or take them away to look into further. Thank you. Thanks for the report. And um, yes, I just wanted to remind members that obviously we're looking at this year's current financials. We've had uh, budget workshops that relate to next year, but can we limit all of our discussions to this year's financials? Uh, Councillor Gilchrist. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I missed the workshop um, due to my wife's health. But I've been following some of the issues, so I'm not quite up to date. One of the key pieces of the jigsaw is this review being carried out of leisure facilities by the consultants. So if there's a target date for that to be circulated for us to study. The reason I ask that is my past studies of earlier budgets over the years, this has been a pretty grim year for anyone working in any leisure facilities that are run by local councils or by trusts or even the private sector, though press reports suggest that some private sector facilities on retail parks are bouncing back, as it were. So the first thing is, over the years, we've always, as a council, been able to support the financially the difference between what our sports leisure facilities cost and what the income is, often to the tune of five or six million pounds a year. Now, it may be that we find ways of offering continued support in future years uh, and I think that's something we really need to devote our, our working hours or sleepless nights to I'm afraid. But the second thing I was looking at was capital. Um, because we're not able to do things with a mixture of builders, equipment, supplies, materials, organising work because we're in an uncertain situation over our leisure facilities we have in that capital programme considerable amount, amounts that were pencilled in which haven't been used. So the first hope is that as part of bidding for capital for next year, when we know the outcome of the consultant study about what actually needs doing to our facilities, because I'm sure I've read somewhere that there's like a backlog of £15 million maintenance if you were to do it all in one go. The, the capital programme included £700,000 for the Oval and other sites. So I'm hopeful that as we can carry on getting our hands on the ability to do that capital work in future years, because in the budget, and this is the boring detail of budgets, there is a minimum revenue provision for capital costs, 
So that minimum revenue position we've got carrying forward with a projection of how it will go in future years, it was rephased or reprogrammed as part of this year's budget exercise. But there is a need to make sure that we can have capital to do things to our sports centres or facilities to improve them as, as the time comes. And the, the third part of that argument is because they've been closed for so much time or only opened re partially, to do those works might require some periods of closure. So it's really a, a big task of planning to get from where we are to where we need to be. So I'll happily take comments on that from officers and our finance people. Yes, there's a lot to go on there. And um, as these are non-statutory services, it is vitally important um, that as a committee we look at that. It's um, plea pleading for money all the time for other things is dependent on what else is being done. So. Um, yes, I appreciate um, your knowledge that you bring to this committee on those matters. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Gilchrist. Um, yes, yeah, so we are due to present a full report on what we're calling the Local Facilities Master Plan for Leisure to this committee, um, probably at the November meeting this year. Um, that's the work you referred to that's been done by the consultants, and it has just about been completed. Um, so obviously when we've sort of digested that, I've not seen it yet, it's not been presented. Um, but that will obviously be brought to members in the hope that, you know, um, we are able to make some decisions around um, the future of some of these sites, because as you correctly say, there is a lot of um, remedial um, capital works other than health and safety that are needed at some of these sites. So. Um, my own view is, you know, uh, would we be, would we spend this this money if we wanted to do something different in some areas? Um, the answer is probably not. Um, so I'd quite like members to see this this full um, report before we make any decisions on spending in the future. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Nikki? Yeah, it was just um, Council Gilchrist around. Obviously, we've had to reduce our revenue expectations, really, because of um, what we've experienced and what we're going through. Um, even now, you know, because we talked about ventilation as well earlier. Although our buildings are open, we're still operating at that uh, reduced capacity as well, based on uh, public health guidance as well. So, uh, I suppose it's just setting that that scene really in those expectations but we will update you with regards to the timetable um, but it's likely to be in November when we when we update the committee further thank you yes I think that that kind of covers the issue where as we went into this current financial year um, we had the ability to to know what we were kind of dealing with and that we, when we started last financial year it was really hard to to know about the the um, income projections did I have Councillor Williams. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah just, uh, just one question. Uh, item uh, 3.18 in relation to the Birkenhead Park World Heritage Site lottery bid and a use of reserve of 37k. Uh, could we have a, a, just, a, just a bit more clarity on that, please? Um, with that, we've got a reserve left over, and what it's related to is because there's some officers are working on the project at the moment, but we can't actually like use the grant funding for that yet. They've, they've actually bid for grant funding, and that's we're hoping to get an answer on that by late September, so we'll hopefully know soon. But in the meantime, there was like no funding to fund the officers' posts. They'll be funded from hopefully from the Heritage Fund once they come in. But at the moment, we had some reserve left over, so just in the interim, we're just using the reserve to fund that person for like for six months of the year until we get the funding agreed, which will hopefully be soon, later in the month, we think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, I just wanted to carry on from uh, what Councillor Gilchrist raised. Um, do we have a general, easily understandable for me, uh, principle around the uh, capex spend and then how it feeds back through? Um, because obviously when services look like they're making a loss, it may be because they've had significant uh, capex, and I don't know about the lifetime and discounted cash flow, and over what lifetime period various things come through. Um. Um, 
it's actually our capital team look after that. So if I take the query back to our capital team and ask them for, for more information on it, will that be, then we can come feed back to you yourself. Okay, that's ready. fine, thanks. Um, you did break down for me the, um, there was a sum called other in, in leisure, which was 6.2 million. You have broken that down for me, thank you. Um, which leaves leisure management at just shy of 5 million. Is it safe to assume that's mostly um, costs around our teams or is there anything else in there? Yeah, a lot of it's actually the staffing part is the costs for the teams. I think that was just under, um, I think it was what, just over 800,000, I think it was for staffing costs, but that's just like relates to pension costs as well and like net NI and pension costs as well and like all the ready to work stuff that go to the other leisure centres. So a lot of it is staffing, but then 4 million is um, just like a target because there's like an income reduction this year because I think Cher recognised that because of COVID, we wouldn't be able to make as much income in leisure as what we've done in previous years. So we've just like reduced the overall target in leisure by four million just as a one-off this year, just to see us through for future years. So I think rather than putting it against leisure centres, like specific leisure centres, because otherwise it'd hide the real cost of the subsidy, we've left it on leisure management now just to reduce the overall income target in leisure. But next year that'll like obviously disappear and we'll get back to usual targets. But we thought it was better rather than allocating it to a leisure centre and then we can't see the subsidy, it'll just hide like the real obviously costs and subsidies when we're looking at savings for future years. So we thought it's best just to sit it on management for the year and then for future years it'll just be a one-off anyway. So I hope that answers the question, but if not, then we can... It does certainly. And... Next year it's going to be very hard to do year-on-year -year comparisons, isn't it? But um, yeah, yeah, it be, yeah but... we were exceptional in lots of, in lots of ways in yeah, this year. Yeah, I think it was good the chair recognised that we wouldn't be able to go back straight back to normal levels. So it was just based on what we thought at the time income will be in leisure so that's just where that's come from thank you any other questions everybody happy everybody's read it thoroughly thank you very much um sarah for presenting that and thank you for breaking it out um further also the extra detail on the capex helps i think we had um nine items at one point about 1.4 million so to see 41 items um, at well over 10 million um, is a lot is a lot more so that must have been quite an extensive piece of work to break it down i do have a concern about one of them and it might be that nikki's able to answer this so in the park section um, obviously there's going to be several elements that might relate to like i think birkenhead park events was mentioned in terms of reserves but there's obviously capex for next year um, but parks machinery, parks vehicles, do we think they may be sitting in the wrong committee in terms of capex? Because if it's machinery for maintenance, um, it's 1.3 million, 2 million next year. I think I think it's machinery for maintenance. It may be sitting in the environment committee. Uh, parks vehicles are they about maintenance as well? Um, so in terms of park improvements and clubhouses and can we just have a quick look at that so we're all way widening obviously we're all way is a fabulous leisure facility but I'd, um, where that sits i'd like some reassurance on um, so i think the library and museum and leisure sections all fairly uh, broadly understandable i accept some of the parks elements might be in but um, there's quite a few that don't look like they fit so if you have a look at those do you want me to? Um, yeah, we can have a look into that. So I think it was just quite hard to split because they all fall into the neighbourhoods director. It was quite hard to split them between the two committees. So we'll have a look into those ones because I think you're right, parks, machinery, that does actually relate to like getting more tractors and more equipment and things. So it does probably sit better on the environment, I think. So we'll have a look into that and then we'll like redo it for obviously for the next um, quarter two reports. That's okay. Okay, thank you. So we did <coughs> cover off there um, really um, both elements of the uh, in-year looking at our budget, um, which isn't too much of a problem in terms of the adverse, and the capex. Are we happy to move to the recommendation? This is uh, a key decision, so I want, um, probably I would like Max back in the room as well, if he's, did he pop to the blue, did he? Or, <laughs> um, I'll just reread the recommendation. So, committee is asked to note the projected year and revenue end forecast position of uh, £328,000 adverse as reported at quarter one, April to June 2021 to 22. Note the progress on the achievement of the approved savings and the projected year end forecast position at quarter one, April to June 21 to 22. 
Also, to note the reserves allocated to the committee for future one-off commitments. And number four is to note the projected year-end capital forecast position. And it says 4.914 million favourable. I'm just going to caveat that with a few that um, may be uh, not sitting with this committee, but we know it's with neighbourhoods uh, anyway as a directorate. Um, and those are all the four um, elements. I'm probably, probably just happy to proceed. I'm happy to propose that. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Spriggs. Are we happy to agree by assent? We are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That brings us on to the item number eight, the work programme update. Um, does anybody have any comments or uh, contributions to make? Obviously, the ones we've discussed um, this evening, a lot of the questions will come up again in October, which is ideal because we then have the uh, cultural heritage strategy as well as the Bergner 2040 framework. Um, and then we have November's very busy because leisure sport of physical activity, future of golf, libraries, all come back uh, in November. And I think we're going to get dashboards in October. Was that, is that still on track? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, does anybody else have anything to contribute? Okay, well, I just have one um, thing that I wanted to uh, bring up because when we look at our, um, the remit of this committee, and the terms of reference, if you want to just scan it down just before the work programme. There's an element in here around the third sector and the communities, and obviously that's been pivotal during um, the pandemic. And um, I'd like to bring that back in, in relation to uh, when you look at our terms of reference, there's an item B on page 32, which reads, um, community engagement, incorporating the council's approach to equalities, inclusion communities, neighbourhoods and the voluntary and charitable sector, community wealth building and social value. I think we'd all agree that's really important to come back to committee. It's not going to be an easy one to schedule, but I definitely want to add that on. Is everybody in agreement with adding that on? It may be something we try and squeeze in towards the end of the financial year because we've got a lot to do on budgets, but I think it's, it's pivotal to, um, to bring that to committee. Everybody agree by assent? Yes. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your time. That brings us to the end of our meeting.